This episode is brought to you by Underground at the Showcase, an official podcast of the Underground Music Showcase. Presented by the great local music nonprofit Youth on Record, Underground at the Showcase is a podcast hosted and produced by young people, the future leaders of our arts community. The show features conversations with some of the coolest local musicians and offers a space for creatives in our community to talk about everything from songwriting to the return of live music in a post-COVID world. Find Underground at the Showcase on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And learn more at youthonrecord.org slash podcasting. Today on CityCast Denver, a revolutionary Chicano theater has achieved a major milestone. They're about to celebrate their 50th anniversary by paying off the mortgage on their theater. So can they make it another 50 on a changing west side? Today is Tuesday, November 29th. I'm Paul Caroli in for Bree Davies, and this is CityCast Denver. Tony Garcia, welcome to CityCast Denver. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, Tony, you're Executive Artistic Director of Su Teatro, which is one of the oldest Chicano theater companies in the country. I wonder how the theater company began and where your story begins with it. In 1971, Don Urioste and other people in the Mexican-American education program at the University of Colorado Denver were trying to recruit and include more Chicano students at UCD. There was something like 40. And there was like a number similar, like to, like less than 200 up at Boulder. And it's ridiculously embarrassing when you think about it. So one of the obstacles that was put up in front of them was that we could not meet the academic standards. And so consequently, we would lower those and hurt our accred the university's accreditation. So they required that any incoming Chicano students that they take a remedial reading class. They asked Rorina Rivera, who was a teacher, they asked her to teach the class and she said, that's insulting, I wouldn't do that. But she had seen Teatro Campesino perform and she said, what I would like to do though is teach a teatro class. And in that class, the students will read, write and perform in English and in Spanish. I think that more than adequately will fulfill your requirements. And they accepted that. And the class began in January of 1972. When I was a kid, I grew up in the Auraria neighborhood I was going to CCD at the time, and but my buddies were all hanging out at UCD at the UMAS, United Mexican American Students. And so I saw them perform in this rec center, and it was like, man, that's really cool. These guys are doing I knew all those guys, and it was funny, and it was everything. And I was going to school because I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to be a writer. I figured the best way I could, the best way I could hone my writing skills was through journalism. Like any guy my age during that time, I had long hair, and I played a guitar because that's the only way you could meet people. <laughs> and it didn't do me any good, but I played guitar. And I played guitar with this guy who was really good. And they heard him perform and they really liked him. But I played with him. So I came with the deal. So they let, I'm, I'm not, people laugh and go, oh, that's probably not true. It's a straight up truth. They were like, okay, you can come, but is Chuck coming too? Is Carlos going to be here? Is he going to wear sunglasses? Is he, all this kind of stuff, right? And uh, I dug it. And in the the summer of 1972, I was able to transfer to UCD, and I took the class in Intro to Chicano Theater. That class was taught by the former students in that first semester, and that's when I became, I got involved in it. I began to write skits for them, octos for them. And the first time they did my octo, I hated it because they just did whatever they wanted. It was really a mess. So I, I started to direct them, and that was the that if I were going to do anything I wrote, I had to direct it. So you, you brought up uh, being from Auraria, which I think folks are still learning about the fact that this was a whole community that was um, displaced and demolished after a city vote. But it's part of the West Side story, right? And and you are currently, Su Teatro is in the West Side. And the neighborhood is changing. Um, I'm thinking about like the Chicano uh, Humanities and Arts Council has moved moved out of the neighborhood. Why does Su Teatro want to stay on the west side? It is a real grounding of of where we are. We still walk. I still walk there. I I lived on 11th and Santa Fe 
where the 7-Eleven is. I walk through that neighborhood and, and it's, you know, a lot of, a lot of people that I, that used to be, used to live there when I grew up with there are there, you know, and, uh, there's a certain sense of this is this is where we all began. This is where the city grew out of because we, that was one of our first non-downtown business districts and such. And so there's, we still get a lot of schools that are nearby. My daughter went to West High School, uh, and so all of those roots are, are there, and, and it's a great connection for us. And coming up to the place where we purchased and we were set, paying off the mortgage of the building is a real powerful statement, I think, to to everybody of where we are, what our roots are, and what we look at it for our vision of our future. I just wonder how much the neighborhood plays a part in you being there, because to me, it's inextricably linked to the West Side and Sioux Teatro. I agree with you. It's kind of interesting that you kind of think that they've gone away, and then they show up at performances and they show up at different things. Or you're walking down the street and they go, yeah, we never moved. We're still right here. You know, uh, we just want to keep it and we want to stay there. There is a lot of of that piece. I am shocked at how small the houses are. <laughs> <laughs> I, I lived there and it was like there was, you know, 10 of us in the house. And now you go, I don't know how we could get fit three, three people in here, right? <laughs> Uh, there's still facilities and, and store, not, I don't know if there's stores, but there's still, there's still places where our community still is, is engaged and they kind of pick and choose where they're going to be. And our place is definitely one of those. I think that that's an important point to make too, is that it's not that everybody has gone away or disappeared or been displaced. There are folks in the neighborhood who have been there who will continue to be there. And who are living their lives. Yeah. They're living their lives. What are you looking forward to folks seeing coming from Sioux Teatro before the end of the year? We are producing the West Side Oratorio, which is about seven generations of families and identity in the Auraria neighborhood. It's a powerful piece that really is very emotional as we talk, go through the periods of, of, I mean, it starts with indigenous people in the Cheyenne and the Arapaho and understanding what it meant to come together at the confluence and where Denver began. And it does take us through that process of when the the community was depopulated, and that's it's that is painful. That is very emotional. Yeah. But it also offers us an, another perspective that uh, the dynamic of I got my degree at UCD. I teach at Metropolitan State University. That's you where know. your neighborhood was. And that's when I walk through the streets. And my it's interesting. We did we did a show about that. The, the actual part of it's called Corrido de Barrio. And my students came, and when we talked to them, many of them are from are first generation, second generation. And I would think they would go, I, their reaction just blew me away. They got very angry that they never, that they didn't know this. I, and it's I not had just that same reaction when I learned that too. But see, but you've lived here, right? Yeah. These guys had never lived here, and they go, why did we not know yeah. this? That we were walking through a space where our people even if it wasn't our direct lineage, walk through this space. But it's also Yolanda Ortega, who's in the production, was the vice president at Metro. So there were tran life transformations that took place there as well as that loss. I did have a conversation, and I don't think Luis will mind me, me quoting him, but we were in a conversation after the play, and I said, I asked him, because he, he, his family was there too at one point, and I said, so if they brought this up to you today, if they said, this is all the things that gained. Luis was the head of Chicano Studies. I said, so if they told you, you get all of this stuff, but we still take the neighborhood, what would you vote? And he said, I would vote that we didn't build it. Yeah. Uh, we did not understand the trauma that that created, dispersing a whole community like that. Now, the universities have tried. There, There, there is a scholarship fund. Right. And part of it has come... People come and see the play, and then they go and they, they 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 get excited, and they go and they start challenging these ideas, which I didn't expect to happen. I only wanted to express what I was feeling and what my community was feeling. But the first time we did a play about this, it wasn't until the end of the first we were watching it. I'm I'm in the light booth, so I'm I always watch the audiences, and I'm watching the audience, and they all start crying, and they're all upset. And it wasn't until afterwards that I realized. There was this loss. There was a pain that had not been addressed. 
and it's still going to be an ongoing conversation. I think it's it's a he there's a opportunities for healing in that that this is about our city and what is our city going to look like going forward and and honoring we we are obviously not going to tear, tear down the university and put the houses back up but what is a place what are the things that we can make going forward So the name of your organization is Su Teatro, which means your theater. Who is the you today, Tony? I think originally what we were talking about was telling our community stories, our basic audiences. But I think this, the you has, has grown to mean those young people who are in our youth programs. I think that we're not only telling Chicano stories, but we're telling Colorado stories. So the you becomes... Our, everybody. There's also an accountability piece that's connected with that. That our job is to is to represent the, the community values and is to is to be a place that belongs to that community. And it's it's not a reason for it to exist if it's not doing that work. Do young people, young Chicanos, still care about the mission of this theater today? I'm almost seventy, and I teach these students who are in 19, 20, and twenty one, and. I don't care what they call themselves. I don't care how they approach what they do. The, jo- the, 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 the goal is for them to discover what they are and what fits best for them. And it's remarkable that they start to understand that the term Chicano is not exclusive. It's actually inclusive. So it becomes a broader term, and they start to understand that they have an opportunity within that context to really shape their own identity and because we have multiple identities. When we're with your family, you have one identity. When you're out in the mainstream, you do. If you're with the within the, the LGBTQ community, you have another identity there. If you're, it's, so all of those things are there. And to say, this is how it all kind of comes together, and this is these are the roots that because we've all explored those. We've all explored that within the, the Chicano context. We have explored those different spaces, and and allowed people to continue to hold on to that memory and to that past and to those things from our ancestors. Our production, the West Side Oratorio, they talk about the concept of seven generations. Seven generations is an indigenous terms that term that refers to the gifts that we were given by our ancestors. So we are the recipients of seven generations of gifts, of insight, right? We are responsible, though, for seven generations going forward. So the idea of seven generations puts us right smack in the middle always. And so we're always, any gift we get, we have the responsibility of passing it on. That's an important concept. That's a very much a concept of a, a, a Chicano movement. And I think it's universal as well. So yeah. when I talk to the young people, it's like, here's, here's the, it's like watering a field, right? That sometimes things come up out of that. Sometimes they don't. It's just you being consistent and knowing that when, when that watering is needed, it'll be there for them and that nurturing. Well, and I'm just thinking about the, you know, I'm, I'm in my early 40s and I know my generation and a little bit younger, there's quite a few folks that I think of when I think about this sort of new Chicano movement here, you know, like Jose Guerrero, Molly Gallegos, Bobby Lafibre, all these people that are doing this work and introducing and keeping and cultivating this idea of Chicano identity alive in Denver. And I think it's really awesome that we have a place that we can go to see that and experience that and understand it and learn it. And all of them are broadening that term. Absolutely. They're broadening their perspective of it. I mean, they've passed through our space, but they've also created other spaces and other other aspects that, I mean, they were going to do that with us or without us. And the yeah. fact that we had some time to travel together, I think, is, is beneficial to the whole community. So I want to look at the, the bigger theater scene here in Denver. Where does Sioux Teatro fit in there? Or how do you see it within this bigger, broader picture of theater in Denver? It's it's going to be an interesting travel forward. I think there is there's more access to people. There is a point where our people are having access to to other theaters and there's a little bit more interest in in not necessarily in the work that we're doing. I still think historically um Sutatro does not get invited to the university's theater by the university's theater part departments. We do not get to invited to uh, collaborate in institutionalized theater. It's just, there. and that's cool. I 
you don't hurt my feelings. I wasn't doing it for you in the first place. But some of people like you mentioned, like Jose, Hoser, uh, Bobby, and Molly, will be invited into those spaces at some point. And I think that's positive. So I think we have a lot of tools to continue to, to, fo- to work on a national, regional, and local level. There is not another group that's producing what we're producing as an organization. The, one of the other problems, speaking to the Denver Theater scene, <laughs> is Denver does not produce enough money to create full-time theater jobs. It's gig work, and, yeah. and that's hard. And we have to create another economy. And I don't think it all has to be in theater like it's in New York. It has to be another way so people can create and and work and and have so they can stay here and continue to do to do that work. That is the bigger problem. That is the problem of and, and Denver's got to get over the idea that we're here in the middle of the country and we're not New York and we're not LA. So what the hell are we? We don't know what we are. You know, we're like four different states, four different four different identities. Is it Western? Is it mountain? Is it urban? Is it the plains? Is it down in the valley? Those are bigger problems. They're bigger. We have an identity crisis. And I don't know what that model is that will allow us. I would prefer that a regional theater actually build a regional theater company here that supports those artists who are part of that rather than import a company, put them on stage, and then send them off. I don't know what we get out of that. I don't know what we as taxpayers, as residents here, get out of that. I mean, and there is a difference between the work individuals are doing and, and the work an institution is building. That's our home, is an institution building so that we can continue to produce bobbies and hosers and, and mollies to go forward. And it will never, never leave our community. It will always be something that belongs to us going forward for another seven generations. Tony Garcia, thank you so much. Thank you. This was fun. And here's what else Denverites are talking about. The killing of Christian Glass. If you'll recall, back in June, Christian Glass was the driver in Clear Creek County who called 911 for support only to be shot and killed by police when they arrived on the scene. NBC News reports that two officers have now been fired and indicted by a grand jury, one charged with criminally negligent homicide and one with second degree murder. This comes after Clear Creek County Sheriff's Department announced back in October that they're working on a new co-responder program with mental health professionals, which many say could have defused the tension that led to Glass's death. And finally, some good news. How great has it been to watch football in Denver lately, huh? I'm obviously not talking about the Broncos, whose coaching has been so bad they've delegated play-calling duties to the mascot, Miles. I'm talking about the World Cup. Even though it's hard not to think about the terrible conditions and obvious corruption that led to the games in Qatar, watching them has been great. And the U.S. men's national team has a big one today. They're going up against Iran, and if they lose, they're out. Will the backup goalie from Highlands Ranch, Ethan Horvath, see some playing time this time? Only one way to find out. That's all for today here on CityCast Denver. If you enjoyed the show, why not take a minute to tell Miles about us? Rate the show wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to our morning newsletter, Hey Denver, by texting Denver to 66866. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. See you then. My name is Tyler. I'm from the uh, Wash Park neighborhood of Denver. just wanted to say that I have occasionally bought some clothes from Costco. So your sign-off on the fashion episode was hilarious. And you first got a lot to do in the park. So thanks a lot. You're a fan of the show.